do re mi. I mispronounced my name and worked hard. Um, <laughs> Danny Van. Yes, I was. You are <laughs> awesome, sir. <laughs> I love this panel. This is great. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, yeah, and, and on, uh, why don't we just sort of like go down, starting with you, and we'll introduce ourselves. You already did. <laughs> Make it out again. It's cool. So what? Okay. All right. Dan. What? Which voices were you? I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, neither do we. Michelle just read them off. Uh, Bumblebee, of course. Don't uh, drop uh, me. Hot spot, fire engine, right? Yeah. Uh, I did the Australian one um, about hot outback. And here's what's weird. Um, I did it, and so did Greg Bird. And yeah, he claims that, that character as well. And here's what I think happened frequently. Uh, we had such a large cast toward the end, as the season progressed. I mean, there were the, 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 the uh, recording studio was just filled with actors. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't called for a certain day, Wally Burr might not have noticed that your character was in that show. So what happened, either, probably, uh, either either I or Greg was not there, and they said, oh, Dan, can you can you do this? And, and, and if I wasn't there, they said, Greg, can you do this? So there's two of us who did, who did Outback. <laughs> I'm sorry for that long explanation, it really wasn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Just, did, they, did they give you a reference if it wasn't your character? Well, I knew, yeah. I, I remember I was cast as, as, as that because he asked me, could you do an Australian accent? And, and, and uh, remember Crocodile Dundee, remember that movie? Yeah. I said, yeah, I've got a knife. That's not a knife, that's a knife. <laughs> and, yeah, you guys do it, you got it. <laughs> Unfortunately, those were the only lines he ever had in the show. Exactly. <laughs> Other than that, I couldn't speak in that dialect. So. It didn't have the word knife in it, he couldn't say yeah. it. <laughs> knife. It's such an excellent Australian. <coughs> knife. Let's That's all say it together. Knife. knife. Just did an Australian accent. Anyway. Yes. Oh, hi. I'm uh, Lori Fossey. Uh, I did mm, uh, Rampage, Dive Bomb, Skydive, and Orion Pass. <laughs> Only in one episode, and I don't know if anybody knew, I certainly didn't, that he would become your number one. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote the episode. Ah. <laughs> Nobody called me. <laughs> Jerry, tell, tell about yourself. Uh, I was uh, Sandstorm, it was my, my main role at Junkyard. Woo. I did Sandstorm, I did Junkyard, and Sweet. So those were those were my three. But Jerry also had a, a, a had 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 a very thriving film career. Didn't say some of your credits. We heard Slapshot, uh, the hockey movie that, uh, that uh, Jerry. Not did. not a lot of hockey fans in the room. Right? <laughs> There's one right there. There's Canadian. They're Canadian. <laughs> but then I had I had the uh, the privilege. Of, uh, are there Brady Bunch fans in the room? <laughs> so they had the, the Brady Bunch when they grew up. We did uh, the girls got married, and I married Marcia. Yeah. So we did we did many incarnations of that, where we got married, where we bought a house together, where 
we went for Christmas, and then they did an hour-long version, a dramatic version of the brain. He said, if you were sleeping that night, you missed it. Um, <laughs> but yes, so that's... Uh, that's and, and, and the summer of, oh, going way back, great movie, you guys. Summer of 42, a real coming-of-age oh, wow. story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you were, what was it, the character's name? Oscar. Oscar. Yeah, that's very nice. That was a, I know they're going to remember that here. Well, I know, but it's if you get a chance, it's probably on DVD. It's a really great movie, and you'll see Young Jerry. He's got brown hair. You definitely see Young Jerry. <laughs> anyway, that that must have really put you on the map, though. That's, that was the first thing I ever did. Tell that story. That that's kind of fascinating. I know this is a Transformers game, uh, but we don't have any questions yet. Uh, there's a, kind of a fascinating story about how he got his first role. Well, it was, it's, it's almost a typical Hollywood kind of story. That was one in North Hollywood High School. And uh, I was in drama, but I wasn't really that involved in that. I worked more backstage. And they were looking for kids. Summer 42 is sort of a coming of age movie taking place during World War II. And um, they were looking for the two main boys in that. And I was, uh, I was in this drama class, and the casting director from Warner Brothers came around looking. They looked back in New York, and now they were looking out here in LA, looking for uh, uh, kids for that movie to, to possibly be in it, and asked if I wanted to come in to try out for a part in the movie. And then, yeah, I, I wasn't involved with the movies. I was in North Hollywood High School, and they're going, I'm sure that'd be great. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so I went in, went over to Warner Brothers, and we met the director and producer, and I thought that was that. And then they had me come back and do a screen test. And that summer, I graduated from high school, and we did, we did that movie. That was a, at the time, it was in the early 70s. It was a big movie for Warner Brothers back in yeah, that was that was like yeah, that was their big movie of like yeah. that year. Yeah, got nominated for a couple of Academy Awards, not me. <laughs> so you guys, you guys uh, should take over. Yeah. That's right. Why did you write in more roles in uh, Transformers? Yeah, let's start with that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a question. Uh, Man, you have a new Bumblebee in the movie. Yeah. yeah. I'm Bryce Malik. Um, hey, he did this guy. Um, I, I was one of the uh, first story editors on the series. Um, I did not participate in the first three episodes, and those were done by George Arthur Bloom before I was hired by Marvel, and uh, I think it was still kind of big shift at that time. And Margaret Lesh brought me over from Hanna-Barbera and with my partner Dick Robbins, and um, we started um, being introduced to this series. It wasn't even a series yet. We were told to try to develop this into uh, 13 episodes, the first 13. So. Um, Dick and I started, we had some rules we couldn't do, we didn't want to do anything with nuclear energy, and they didn't, you know, there were some things we had to add, like the, the, uh, the transport bridge, space bridge, and things like that, so they, the, the Autobots and Decepticons could move back and forth in the universe fairly quickly. And um, we decided it was pretty much going to be an action show, and they pretty much knew which, um, Transformers they wanted to deal with. After the first 13 were done and were somewhat successful and on the air, that's when they decided to go for the whole rest of the 65 package. So we were doing like one a week. Um, now, of course, we had writers working on them concurrently, so we were always having some new shows and some development and some scripts and such. That's when David came in online and uh, we would have to produce the script a week so they could be storyboarded. Very quick thing it was like very fast, but on the other hand, 62 episodes at one a week is that's over a year. And by the time that's done, when they start showing up on TV, it's one a day. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like really fast, like seeing your life go in front of you. Um, <laughs> yes, there were lots like, of characters. Had Hasbro and Sunbow had outlines of which characters they wanted to be introduced and which number of episodes. So we would say in this episode we would have to introduce these characters, so quickly come up with a story to have these characters, blah, 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 blah. And then we'd have to run through that and do that as quickly as we could. I think in Generation 1, I kind of I know over 100, maybe 104 characters, including the humans. And uh, that's a lot. That's a hell of a lot. Um, we didn't really, I didn't know any of the voice actors. I never saw any of those happen. I, I, sometimes I saw the storyboards when they were completed, if I had time, or if they told us what they liked or didn't like about the show. And uh, it was uh, an 
exciting time. No one knew it was going to be a big hit. I certainly didn't know that 35 years later, I'd be sitting here in front of people who actually enjoy it and watch the show. Yeah. So I'm proud to be a part of that. Mm. Pay heed to what this guy says because literally every episode except for the first three of the 65, I guess they're called season one, season two, every episode went through his machine in his yeah. head and, and came out. He, he, was, he was responsible for making changes to develop the original premises, develop the stories, work with the writers on every episode up until season three, or as I call it, the Nanny Flint Dilly season. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy is like a huge importance. <laughs> and David, David wrote all the really good scripts. <laughs> <laughs> My name's David Wise. I'm probably best known for taking a crappy little black and white comic called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And <laughs> showrunner on that for 10 years. I also won the only Emmy, the original Star Trek ever won in any way, shape, or form from the very first TV show of the animated Star Trek and won Best Children's. Excellent. It was the, not only the only Emmy the original Star Trek ever won, it was, it's the only what they call creative Emmy that Star Trek has ever won. So there's that, but I also worked on Transformers. I wrote Attack the Autobots, Microbots, um, uh, uh, Secret, of, uh, Secret of Omega Supreme, Key to Vector Sigma, War Dawn, Frenzy, The Girl Who Loved Power Glide, Main Tracks, Autobot, Trans Europe Express, uh, a couple others that I'm forgetting, and the entire Rebirth miniseries that, which by the way had 70. Uh, 91 Autobots in three episodes. So you talk about, oh, we had 120 characters over 65 um, that ended what is known as Generation 1 Transformers. And it looks like we have a lot of people with a lot of questions. You are. Well, two questions. But well, one comment and a question. I love that shirt. Yes. yes. I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> love it. And my question to you is. If Transformers back in the 80s wasn't all about selling toys, just primarily about selling toys and just about telling the story, would you all have created the story a little differently? Yeah, well, yeah, except I never felt it was really about selling. It was only about selling the toys in that do an episode about this character. I never thought of, we didn't, the toys weren't out, were they? We didn't really see the toys. So it was like, oh, well, we have these, we have this toy coming out called the Constructicons, right? Uh, so you know, do 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 a show. Either. We got these. Uh, we have we we have Autobot planes coming. So we call the Aerial Bots, right? So do a show about them. And to us, I mean, to me, I can't speak for you, but it's like they were just characters. They weren't toys. I didn't think of them really as as, as putting toys on the shelf. What I did know from being a kid myself is that the more personality and the more depth and interest your characters have, the more a kid is going to want the toy, which was my whole approach to it. So, But it ultimately was just really all about the writing. I can't imagine I would have done anything. It would have been fewer characters, obviously. Yeah, that's, that there would have been. You know, honestly, yeah. <laughs> Especially in the reverse. I mean, my God, the headmasters, the target masters, the this masters, the, the, it's just <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, but yes, that's well, well played. That was the, the joke back then. That, you know, I'd come and I'd do an episode and I'd be gone for a long time and I came back and I think it was Michael Bell. I came back and I said, hey, Michael, he went, hey, I haven't seen you in a while, Jerry. What's wrong? Your toy not selling? <laughs> <laughs> that's why they killed Optimus Prime in the movie, was that they sold all the Optimus Prime toys that they were going to sell. And nobody asked me. I had no involvement with the movie. But when I heard that, I was like, do they have their freaking minds? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Optimus Prime? 
That's not how you do it, you know. But they, but they had a new wave, I guess they call them, of toys to sell. So yeah, that's 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 the day. That's that's where it affects the story. For the voice actors, uh, celebrate choir. I'm sorry, <laughs> but um, I love your book, Dan. I love your book. When you talk story, thinking <laughs> back on the book, you told some great stories in that book, and I was wondering if you two also had wonderful stories when it came to you know working in the background with Transformers and the other voice actors as well. I like the uh, the trash the, the burning trash can stuff. <laughs> that was awesome. All true. Yeah. All true. Yeah. 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 All true. One of you all, if you, uh, Laurie, you had, Jerry, you had similar yeah. stories. No, I was like, he, he, he captured. The, I mean, he definitely had the highlights of what went on in those sessions. I mean, I think you you talked about the long sessions that that Wally would have. Yeah, they went on. When, um, when we started the show, um, uh, the typical actor's uh, day is eight hours uh, with, a, with an hour break for lunch. That's the union, that's the union requirement. So to do uh, a half an hour show, which is actually more like 22 minutes, right? Yeah. 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 After you pick out the, the commercials and the intro and outros. Um, so to do a 22 minute show, we would work for eight hours. We would do a table read of the script, and then Wally would flog us for the rest of the day. <laughs> and I'm talking about, you know, 20 takes, 30 takes of go get it, uh, until Wally was satisfied that he got the right sound. And then just to add to your story, so what I figured out, because I came in, and they'd be they going, Wally would go take after take after take, and be like, you know, okay, Jerry, and he'd always do it this way, okay, we're rolling, and okay, uh, you're up, you know, go get him. Right, and and then the guy would go, go get him, or go get him, or whatever they would do, over and over again. I'm doing the same thing, you know, it's take after take, until one time he went, okay, let's try it again, Jerry, go get him, and I went, go get him, and he went, great, that's great, and I realized all he wants me to do is what he just said. <laughs> you know, they have all these actors, really creative guys, and everything else, and everybody's trying to, you know, put their own stuff into it and everything else, and Wally heard it the way Wally heard it, and that's what he wanted to get, and I would get in it, I would get out. <laughs> He like gave you blind reading? Oh my oh, god. Oh totally. yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh he oh, must have yeah. hated that. It was the only way to survive. <laughs> it got me right out the door. <laughs> yeah. You have to understand when we talk about Wally, we're talking about Wally Burr, who was the director of all these shows. Voice director. The voice director. And Wally was a guy who was uh, very specific. He knew what he wanted. He was uh, Hardcore and you know, let's get it done. Uh, Good guy. He was a great guy. We all loved him. We all had a great time with him. He's since passed away, but he was he was wonderful to work with. And we had a great time. He came into the studio one morning. I remember with a black eye and bruises all over his face, and we all said, "God, Molly, what happened to you?" Ah, some guy sucker punched me in a bar. <laughs> so, that was Wally. And he, was, he was the real deal. Right. We, we have a lot of people, so have we yeah. answered your No, 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 that's it. Thank Where's you Michelle, our MC? Did yeah. she, she ditch us? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Ellie. Hi, Ellie. Uh, I'm a big fan, Dan. I love your book. Um, I have a question for all of you. So, you know, you worked on this 1984 to 1986, and how does it feel, like, seeing your character that you worked with once, thinking it was only for toys, now becoming such a great thing in pop culture, and there's even a rival universe in all these films. How, how does it feel as that? Guys? Uh, well, uh, weird. <laughs> um, uh, surprising. But I, I think, you know, honestly, for me, because I did Turtles and that just kept rolling, that never. Tr Transformers kind of quieted down for like a decade there. Whereas Turtles just kept going and going and going. And when, you know, when. when so when Transformers came back, I was like. Can they make a go of this? I mean, especially with the feature film, and the, you know. And uh, uh, so I, I wasn't expecting it, and it was. I had a very weird experience in I think the summer of 2011 of being in London and seeing three buses go by. First one with with a post or a billboard for the new Star Trek movie, which I was involved with, the original Star Trek. The next with 
the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, and then the third one with, I think maybe Revenge, it might have been the second Transformers film. Um, and, and I was like, wow, that's like a hat trick or a trick. <laughs> it's all, all this stuff is still going. What the heck happened? No, and, and, and I will say one other thing, which is, I'm not a big fan of the Bay Transaction. <laughs> It's like one of my shows where they finally got it right because my shows, if you were there when I reeled off all the, very often just had one transformer interacting with one human being in a and developing really a relationship. Girl with a little power drive, main tracks, Autobot, all uh, uh, all of those were basically very similar in approach to the Bumblebee movie. Which apparently, am I, mis am, am I misinformed, but made to like a bucket load of money. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How, do you, how do you feel about the Mumblebee movie? Um, um, I have mixed feelings about it, what's happened since we did the show. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Bay movies either, and a lot of the Gene Wilder fans. <laughs> Uh, so I have mixed feelings about it, but one thing I will say about the Bay movies and the, the, the latest incarnation of the Bumblebee movie, which I have not seen, but I understand it's a, it was a big improvement over what Bay was doing with the series, is kept it in the public eye. And what's happened is a lot of kids, a lot of uh, younger people are seeing the movies, and then maybe their parents or an older person will go, well, you know, there, that was a cartoon show back in the 80s. They go back and they look at that, so we build a whole new fan base for what we did. So in a way, it's a good thing, in a way, it's not so great for me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Just, in, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. You know, in, in uh, reference to what you said, is first of all, I'm not a big fan of the Bay movie. <laughs> When you do, when you do voice acting and, and it's a career, and you do it over years and years and years, it's really cool to be involved in something that is meaningful to people this many years later. I mean, it's really, it almost, I don't mean to sound corny, but it feels like a, it's a privilege to be involved in something that really touched people. In whatever way it touched each person that it touched, it means something to them. And, they, and to do that and be a part of that, and you were a far bigger part of it than I was, but to do that is, I don't know, it feels very special now. I, you know, I'm glad I'm it makes it exciting you had a chance to be part of that. And we had so no idea when I went on, did, did that, did something else. We had no idea that this was part of the people's lives. Yeah, most of us did, did right. tons of shows during that, and, and very few of them had the kind of legs that Transformers have. So it's, it was a privilege, and it was it was a lucky break for a lot of us. Yeah. We could have been on Turbo Team or Robots. Yeah. <laughs> That you have, you might autograph me. Sure, I'll come come at the table after the after Okay, the, thank after. you. Sure. Like Lori said though, and is that you also didn't know that it was having an effect on people. You go in and do it, you do it. I mean, you did all your episodes long before you really knew that it was anything. I'll so tell you, you, here's here's something. This is I don't want to get maudlin, but I will for a second. When I did my first convention, this kid in a wheelchair came up, and. Um, he said, I just want to thank you. I was going through a really difficult time in my life, and that show helped me get through it. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, something that we did actually had that great an effect on someone's life. And you want to talk about an honor and a humbling uh, experience? That is a humbling experience and, and um, something I, I, I'll be grateful for mm -hmm. until I, until I uh, have expired. Gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for coming. I mean, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you, uh, not just for being here, but for what you've done. Because you guys help create something. You guys help start something that, to me, like you feel these characters on a sensory level. Like you feel these characters, like you feel Snoopy and Charlie Brown and the Peanuts or Scooby Doo and Shaggy. You feel these characters. You don't think about them. And I feel like without you guys, that doesn't happen. So I wanted to personally thank you for that. And for David, 
uh, KJ Abrams, Bob Morrissey, and Alex Kurtzman can eat their hearts out because they never got named to start a <laughs> um, So I, I guess my question is for you gentlemen, when did you realize that, because you know, if, you know, you're doing a lot of these shows back in the 80s when we're having all, when we have the deregulation and they're able to do all these cartoon and toy shows, but when did you start really realizing that this one I guess had legs in that, wow, people really like this and like what we're doing. I got an answer for that. Ooh, Ooh. Thank you. Ooh, I know the answer to this one. Um, it was seeing the absolute hatred that parents of children would direct at me at the time when I said, oh yeah, I'm working on a show, or I, I wrote for a show that was on last year called Transformers. And they were like, that was you? My kid wants every one of those? <laughs> and, 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 and it was, and the reason why I say it wasn't the hatred that gave it away, but it was like the kids were obsessed. Absolutely obsessed. I mean, you were all those kids, so you were probably obsessed. And, and the parents would always be like, why is my child, why is, you know, why are they so obsessed with these stupid robots that turn into cars? And my answer was, can you make the robot turn into a car? Do you know how to do that? They were like, no, I don't know how my kid does it. So can you make the car turn back into the robot? No, I don't know. They said, it's something that kids can do that parents don't get at all. <laughs> they absolutely don't get. So it really belongs to the kids. And, uh, and But seeing how obsessed the kids were is probably the only reason why I'm not completely gobsmacked that we're all sitting up here talking about them. Because, believe me, for all of us, this was just a job, you know? I mean, it was, that's, it was just like one, of, one of many jobs. <clears throat> the guy who was just up here who asked the question has, had this really cool t-shirt on that showed Skeletor and said, make Eternia great again. <laughs> 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 Any of you guys work on that show? He -Man? I worked on He-Man no. here. <laughs> Um, I always said Transformers had the best voice. And, and, and honestly, it did. You could have written for us. It had the yeah. greatest voice cast of any cartoon. I think it was like anybody who was anybody, especially anybody who was anybody who was good, was because the cast was so vast. You know. But every one of those voices, some of that was you guys, and some of that was Wally. Yeah. Because Wally did. I'm not surprised to hear that he sort of gave you line readings. Because it was you no know how to get the sound. <laughs> you know, he had that sound, and it's like I always wanted every show I wrote to have that. That there's a sound to the Transformers yeah. voice work. Well, Wally got that sound. You know, there's there's something called storyboards, which the director looks at before the recording session, and they're like basically like you know comic book uh, panels that shows what's happening in each scene. And Molly would study those the night before, and I, I'm sure for hours, and decide how each yeah. line should be read. And that's where this line reading thing, I think, came from. But if you gotta hand it to him. He came up with something that sure lasted. But the thing is, you you watch those shows and just close your eyes, or, or you know, turn off the picture or something, or just record them. And they're, they're as much fun to listen to as they are what affects in a lot of cases, the voice work and the general soundtrack work is better than the crappy Korean <laughs> sea level Spoken animation. Like that a true writer. <laughs> I don't need the pictures, just listen to the word. <laughs> so the Transformers, they made great radio. That was, that was you guys, and it was Walla. A lot of it was Walla. Anyway. Hi, Dan. I haven't seen you since the first time I met you, uh, BotCon 2004. Wow. Uh, we go back a long way, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I've been going to do that for a long time. Uh, anyways, uh, I remember uh, when the first movie was coming out, somebody asked you a question about the movie, and you said, as, uh, what you thought about Bumblebee in that movie, and you said, and this is very funny because I still remember, you said you, you were interested to see how, what they would do as long as it's not then it will be, be naked and <laughs> yellow. Um, you said something to those lines. Huh? Apparently it was a lot funnier at the time. <laughs> anyway, so the big question is, now that the movie's out, and now you already partially answered the question, so what do you think of the different characters, characterization of Bum Bumblebee, and not also directed to the uh, uh, <laughs> your fellow voice actors? What do you think of your characterization of your characters since then? Uh, different iterations of 
Well, I, 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 understand. I haven't seen the, the, the Bumblebee movie, um, but I understand it's a lot gentler. It's, it's kind of a, a girl and her dog sort of, uh, sort of <coughs> movie, plot-wise. Um, so I, apparently there's a lot more heart to it, which I appreciate because I think we had a lot, in addition to all the, the you know, as writers, in addition to all the, the, you know, fighting and all the battles and stuff, there was a lot of heart going on. There was, um, you know, there's a real bond between these characters, and I think that was another reason that this show uh, really worked, is because you believed that these guys had each other's backs and they were loyal to one another, and uh, that's from the writing. I mean, that's that's pure writing. Am I wrong? Oh, well, that was Wally Burke. <laughs> <laughs> that was from the writing. Yeah, it was. I was always like, you know, well, these robots are on Earth. They have no reason to care about the human race. They're involved with a war with another bunch of robots. The human beings just happen to be the little organic life forms that are standing in between them. But the Autobots don't do that. I, uh, uh, what you think of as a normal ro robot would not care, but the Autobots care because they all these because they're really just metal humans, you know, <laughs> it, it, with with circuits who can be repaired. But it was always to me what was interesting was why would they care about us? Why would they care about making sure we were protected in their fight against the Decepticons? And that to me was kind of where always the human story was. It has to be. A human story, you know, and and, and funnily enough, with the Transformers <coughs> movies, the character with the most character is Bumblebee, who doesn't speak. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only, only Peter Cullen is really happy about the Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> and Frank Welker's back too. I mean, you know, as Megan. Oh, what is that? No, I'm <laughs> Frank's I, brilliant. I, <laughs> he's the best. He's I, a hero. I, He's the only voice actor I have ever almost repeatedly demanded on every show yeah, I've been on. As yeah. you guys know, they don't let the help <laughs> into the voice sessions. You know, we don't we don't count. Frank Frank Welker is a friggin' genius. Yes, he is. No, I, I was not trying to diminish. He's our hero. Yes, yeah. well, uh, thank, thank you. Hi, thanks guys for being here. Um, First of all, one comment about Trim Zeke. I always thought it was the Trouble with Triples episode for Transformers. So. <laughs> it's really gremlins. Uh, yeah, it's but there is, there, is, there is a little, and by the way, David Gerald, who wrote that episode yeah. of Star Trek, yeah. was the first new person I met when I moved to L.A. in 1972 at age 17. It's, I mean, I had a couple of friends like Harlan Ellis and whatnot who lived here. And, and when I went over to Harlan's house, he said, oh, this is my friend David Gerald. And was like the trouble with trouble guys, and he's like, yeah, <laughs> they was my first friend. But I, I never thought of it that way because it was totally at the time. Think about this, 1984. 84, right? Yeah. It's Gremlins was yeah. what was it? <laughs> um, question though, for I guess both you, but also for but for Bryce, as far as like the pitches you've got for stories, constantly that you know the story editor had to go through so many. Were there pitches that? What were the you know ones that were interesting but had to be rejected for certain reasons or stories? And you're like, I wish we'd gotten a chance to do. This particular story. This is a very I don't think there's um, any pitch that we rejected that was really interesting that we wish we could have done. We were really searching for anything that would really work. Uh, there were a lot of pitches that were off the beam, kind of, sort of. I mean, I remember mostly had, for me. <laughs> one was about a, a, a planet somewhere where they would have um, robot prostitutes. <laughs> I don't remember the whole thing. It was kind of like a Vegas theme kind of thing. I don't think so. Thank you very much. Yeah, we had something like that. That sound, those sound like the stories that Eastman and Laird would pitch. Yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. The one started off with blood spattered walls and death and corpses everywhere. And I'm going, did they get we're doing a kid show here? Thanks very much. They'd be prosticons. The whole line of toys there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it transforms into a marital aid. Alright, <laughs> 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 right, please bring us back. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we do give a lot of. Uh, well, we, we know how we feel about the, the Bay movies, but I will give, like, like you were saying, um, I will give them credit because the 07 movie was the one that got me into Transformers. And, like, it was, you know, the connection between the humans and the robots was what sparked my interest. And then, so my friend and I went and we watched 
we, we tracked down the 80s cartoon and we're like, admittedly came into it thinking, oh, we'll, we'll go and find the 80s cartoon, it's probably going to be silly, and we'll just, you know, have a good time looking at it, and just fell in love. I mean, it, that, it, the, you, got, you guys got us into Transformers, really. So I wanted to say thank you for all of that. Um, my question would be, is there a episode that was your favorite one to work on, or to make, or to come up with, or for everybody? We're done. Yeah. <laughs> Transport to Oblivion. Oh, did you write that? I wrote that. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Because that, that was the first time you really got a, 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 that relationship between Bumblebee and sure. Spike. Yeah. Right, yeah. I always yeah. liked Bumblebee. Um, I always thought being the smallest, he probably was like, he was so glad to see he got his own movie. <laughs> Bumblebee was kind of foregrounded in uh, Attack the Autobots, wasn't it? Was it that or was it? No. Yeah, because I remember, because Attack the Autobots was my first episode. And I remember, you know, going through the phone book list of all the characters in the show and going, well, this Bumblebee guy is really interesting because he's the underdog, he's sort of the pipsqueak, nobody takes him seriously. And my recollection, I haven't seen the episode in forever, can anybody tell me? Does that, did, my recollection is that I, I sort of led with him. Is, am I right or? Uh, he had a lot, he had a lot to do with it, but you know, I think, in my opinion of that episode, Bumblebee went through a lot of emotional things because of what was going on with Optimus. Uh, right. Because Optimus was taking over, he couldn't believe that that right. pretty much happened to him. But isn't it Bumblebee who kind of like is the one guy who saves all the Autobots? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, yeah, no, I was, no, so like first thing out of the gate, I was attracted to that character because it just struck me as being the most interesting. I knew I liked you right away. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know why. Now, in my second episode, oh, shit. In my second episode <laughs> I foregrounded Perceptor. Okay, so that was like, I'm, I'm like, okay, he turns into a oh my God. Nobody is doing this guy. Give me this guy. So, what if they shrink down? That was Microbots, where they shrunk down. Yeah. Uh, uh, where famously the Decepticons all got drunk on the on internet. <laughs> Dave, can you talk more to the microphone? The people in the back can't hear you at all. Okay. <laughs> My favorite episode were the ones that I was in. <laughs> we didn't, do you remember the, the titles of some of the episodes? Some of them, yeah. Uh, I sort of don't. I mean, it was on the front page, that's all we know. And it's just Marley saying, do this! You know, so. But uh, it was wonderful to do. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> with the uh, G1 cartoon because I started with R.I.D. 2001 and then was given a, a DVD box set of the G first season of the G1 cartoon and that was like really early when I was at a baby so I got that and I got really into it and I've been a fan ever since. Uh, but a question I've always um, wondered is kind of going off of what he was saying if G1 was written differently, more shows now, the ones that are big, big like Prime or uh, East Wars which are narrative driven have like a set uh, list of characters, giving you guys have written the characters, play the characters. Uh, is there anyone in particular, like a team of favorite characters you'd have that think would work for the best small dynamic for a show, such as Prime or something? I don't know, I always like the stronger characters, like Starscream, because I thought he was more fun to work with. Um, but I don't know if we had a group of any kind that we thought were cool together. I, I kind of did that with uh, Keta Vector Sigma, where it was the aerial bots versus the, the Stunticons. Um, I tried to think of the other groups, but it was like the Constructicons. I always found them pretty boring. I don't know why, they just, it was hard to give them much personality because they were all about the same thing, which was building stuff. So, um, so that's, that's a tough one, but I, I, yeah, I, would, I, I, I sort of feel like I already did that in the original series. And, and when you talk about the later, like like uh, Prime and Beast War, are you saying? Because I have not watched every iteration of Transformers since then. I, are you I saying have they have continued, like like story arcs running through the? the yeah, season? yeah. The, the, you know, like they have a smaller cast. Uh, much of the smaller cast gets. Yeah. You know, like if they, there's characters who could be developed more because season two has. A large cast, but most of the characters get one episode. To yeah, that. yeah, it's yeah. Very so, but you're talking about developing out. groups. Like, are there groups that are? Doing? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if there was like any, like a set you had a favorite that you wish you could have like expanded on more. If the show was 
I, 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 don't, I think I, I think I, it, I think most of them were like good for an episode. And then, you know, I, I, I could bring them, like we had to bring back tracks and Raul because some people really like to make tracks for some reason. But, you know, I feel, I felt, kind of felt like I made my statement on that character, one and done, you know, but that's just me. Maybe other people have smarter opinions. We have 10 minutes, nine technically, um, and Daniel, we throw the bell. There's a long line for your honor. Thank you, said modesty. I would like to add, request the seven people, because I, 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 11 years of doing this have told me that there's. So actually, the early script, were you aware of the transformation from Bumblebee to Goldbug, and what do you think of that? No, and I hated it. <laughs> yeah, and that's my answer. And it's brief. I had a question for uh, Dan, and do you have a favorite quote from uh, Bumblebee? As a matter of fact, I do, uh, and it's on the buttons that we give away. Uh, at, we brought a bunch of buttons that, that we give away uh, to people who come to our table, and it's uh, some of my best. Some of my best friends are human. <laughs> Thank you. This is a question for Dan. What does Bumblebee mean to you? Great question. <laughs> Brief. 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 Yeah. Uh, Brief. Wow. Um, it, as I said, it was an honor, it was a privilege to voice it. None of us knew what this was going to be. I just did the best job I could do with the character from what these guys had given us and we'll hope to honor the character. Um, the Bumblebee is one of the two characters that I'm most proud of. The other is Spider-Man from Spider-Man and his amazing friend. So, to me, to me, those are the big two for me, and the, the, the fact that he had so much heart, he loved Optimus so much, he was so loyal to him, he looked up to him, um, that's, it, it, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. And, and so does your, your fandom, guys. Thank you. Thank you for taking the opportunity to say thank you to each and every one of you for being here, being part of our childhood. I grew up in the latchkey kid era. You all taught us what it meant to be loyal and to be honest and to be good people. And David, I'm shaking right now just having the opportunity to tell you, you are a national treasure. <laughs> what, you, what you created, what you've given us, for you to say that, that, that was just a job, makes you all the more extraordinary to me. And you made me want to be a writer and am a writer. Thank each and every one of you. Um, what would be a good one you prefer for Bumblebee? The Chevrolet Camaro or Volkswagen Beetle? And my second question is, who's the better nemesis for Bumblebee? Barricade or Knockout? Alright, I'm not going to even honor that first question. <laughs> uh, and the second one, uh, what was the two characters that you named? Barricade and Knockout. Uh, I'll pick Knockout. <laughs> my brief answer. <laughs> So you're going with Knockout? <laughs> Who the hell is Knockout? <laughs> uh, question for everyone. Do you collect Transformers and what is your favorite? I had, uh, okay, here's, okay, you asked me what I thought about this show. When I first got this job, this was one of the, this was only the second job in animation that I had. Amazing Friends was the first. Then I got this role. And um, I went to Toys R Us and bought a slew of Bumblebee toys. M I C, man, mint on card. And over the, I mean, I had like 12 of them. I wish to God I had them now. Because <laughs> I put them on eBay so fast. <laughs> I, gave, I gave them away over the years to uh, to fans. So that I no, I have none. Were all your original baseball cards, right? I, yeah. Exactly. I don't collect any Transformers, but I did buy a couple. The only ones I could find that I really could find at the beginning. I own. I still own a Soundwave with a Woo! little cassette, uh, and I own a Bumblebee. Oh, hey. Hey. I, I I I want to point out. We were talking about, we bought our train. Nobody comped us. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really collect. I mean, I, I got a bunch. I usually got the ones I, I wrote, and I didn't really have a favorite. Maybe Megatron, or yeah, or Soundwave, because, because of the cassette, and then the cassette turning into the 
And during the, the, the first generation, I always wanted an Optimus Prime, and, and they never had them in the stores. Oh. Ever. Oh. Yeah. I, I, I still have mine. <laughs> <laughs> Have, I didn't have any, and my son came and visited me here, and while I was signing, I, he walked around and found a sandstorm for me. So, uh, he got it, so now I've got one. Yeah. But it's a new one. They're different. The, yeah. the new yeah. versions are different. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> Thanks, they're going to kick us out. You, know, you don't want to take it and go, this isn't a G1. But, uh, 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 two more. For G1 in particular, what guided you to include the advanced and technical language? Thank you for not talking down to the kids. I watch it now and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And for the voice actors, was it difficult to kind of enunciate or to repeat a lot of what the writers had come up with? Did I use a lot of technical language in my yes. I did. Uh, because I, I wrote for the eight-year-old kid in me. And as, as an eight-year-old, I never wanted to be talked down to. So I never talk down to the audience. I assume if they don't know the answer, they'll go ask an adult. Uh, and 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 most of the time, I just assume they they knew the answer. So, and that was because that's how I would have wanted it when I was a kid in a cartoon fan. Very nice. <laughs> Uh, in animation, you don't memorize the script, you have to read it off the page. So that being the case, it made it a lot easier not having to memorize the, the different terms, the different words, and you're able to just read them, figure them out in rehearsal. Right, write them right up phonetically. <laughs> and then just read them off. Did you ever get a description of the Transformers from like the back of the box or from Hasbro or from the comic book? Yes. Yes. And then yeah. you're like, you know, this character isn't going to work on the cartoon, and I'm going to change it up. <laughs> yeah, do you remember any of that? Definitely. Well, the, the product description on the back of the box, we had that. We also had suggestions from Sunbow, which weren't always the same. They were sometimes different. And we could pretty much do what we wanted to. There were a couple of characterizations we, we tried and couldn't do. We tried to do one uh, uh, Transformer who was paranoid, and we were told that was like a DSM mental health issue, so we had to stay with him now. But we could pretty much do what we wanted to because they weren't always the same. And the comic books weren't the same either. So. I have to tell a story about Bryce, and then I think we're, we're done, but regarding the characters. Uh, so Hasbro, or Sunbo, calls up Bryce and says, we're going to do a story about Omega Supreme. Uh, not Omega Supreme, Vector Sigma. And Bryce says, what's a Vector Sigma? <laughs> now, bear in mind, nothing had been recorded yet, so we didn't really know what was going on. He says, what's a Vector Sigma? And, and Sunbo says, oh, that's the supercomputer that gave all of the Autobots and Decepticons, all the Transformers, their personalities. And Bryce and me, without dropping a stitch, he shot back, well, it must not work very well. <laughs> These guys are all paper thin. The stuff you keep giving us is like nothing. <laughs> I'd like to say to everyone, you, you come here and been really gracious and talk so much about what the show's been to you and thanking us for being here. I just personally want to thank you guys for coming out and, and supporting the team. Yeah. You're the one, you're the one that wants to continue to give this life and continue to give it the, the life that it has. And, and it means the world to me, so thank you very much. Like we said, they are all available for autographs. Excellent. In the healer room? Uh, no, it's 